very good morning brothers and sisters friends and family and everybody else who is just joining us this morning i hope that everybody is doing well this morning and that you are excited to just join us as we sing songs of praise and worship this morning and also as we listen to the word of god it's truly going to be an exciting service uh we've got some a variety of songs lined up for us to just worship god this morning and also our brother uh jonathan from uh, sweden is actually going to be giving us the word of communion and i hope that we can just open our hearts to just be inspired by our brother's word and also later on uh john our lead evangelist is going to be coming on to give us uh, the main sermon and i hope even for that we can just open our hearts and just be able to listen to the word of god and just let it work in our lives but before we go forward in our service let me just go to god in a word of prayer as we start Our dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just want to thank you uh, just again for another morning that we can just come together, Father God, to just be able to worship you, Father God, to be able to listen to your word, dear God. I know that there are a lot of people who have not made it to this time, Father God, but we are so appreciative this morning of the fact that you saw it fit for us to just see this day, dear God. I pray, Lord, that we may not take this for granted, Father God, but just uh, throughout the day, find ways, Father God, that we can show you our gratitude for this opportunity dear god uh we just want to pray for those who are not feeling well this morning father god that you may strengthen them father god you may just uplift them father god for those who are experiencing loss father god who have lost loved ones father god that you may also father god just touch their lives and just bring comfort into their hearts dear god we thank you so much for the gift of the kingdom of god father god for jesus who died for us on the cross uh, just giving us this opportunity that we are able to be in your presence father god even as sinful as we are We are still able to reach you Father God as long as our hearts are willing and are open to accepting you dear God. We thank you so much for who you are and what you continue to do for us Father God. Be with this service Father God. I pray that you may just uh, uh, allow us Father to just have an awesome time uh, just experience you in this morning dear God. We thank you so much for everything that you do for us and pray that you go before each part of the service this morning and pray all these things through your son's name Jesus Christ with thanksgiving in our hearts. Amen. Amen everyone let's have a great time of worshiping God in song
Good morning, church. At this part of the service, we're going to take communion together. My name is Jonathan, and I'll be sharing a few thoughts on this topic. Right now, I'm here in Zambia for a few more months, and I'm doing an internship with Hope Worldwide. And uh, I must say that, that I, I, I just feel so grateful. Uh, grateful to you guys, uh, to the church, to the Hope office, to Peter and Wendy and your family for hosting me. Uh, I, I, I really feel taken care of and loved. Uh, so thank you for taking on a stranger like me. As we jump into co uh, communion, I, I would like to ask us a question. Um, when we look at our lives, when you look at your life, what do you see? What do you see when you look at your life? For the past weeks, we've been looking at the story of Nehemiah, right? And today, reading chapter 4, I believe something that has stood out for me is seeing the tension between him and the world. Because Nehemiah, he's, he's consumed with this dream. He's passionate and he has a vision. But at the same time, we're reading about all the opposition that he's facing from the world. We read about the anger, we read about the mockings, we read about this conflict that arises between Nehemiah and the world, really. And it's strange because, you know, what Nehemiah is seeing, the, the project of Nehemiah, is, it's, it's not any different from what the world is seeing. Yet, they still draw completely different conclusions and they're filled with completely different emotions just from looking at the same thing. And I want to bring this, this idea, this concept um, into communion because, you know, I think this is really what communion is about. How do we see things? How do we see our lives when we look at them? On the day of crucifixion, when, when, when Jesus was uh, crucified, um, I believe we had two types of people present. There was one type who, when they looked up on the cross and they saw Jesus, they really saw the Son of God. And they saw the love, they saw his sacrifice. Yet, on the very same soil, in front of the same cross, there were those who looked up. And they laughed, and they ridiculed him, and they mocked Jesus, and they did not believe. They doubted Jesus' claims. And I believe that that is the reality of the world that we're living in. It's the reality of Jesus' world, of Nehemiah's world, and your world, and my world. And I think we need, we need to remind ourselves, are we looking at things through the eyes of the world, or through the eyes of God. Because really, communion, it's all about remembering. When Jesus instructed us to take communion, he said this, do this in remembrance of me. And what are we to remember? Well, I think it's that simple. 
let us remember to look at our lives through his eyes. Let's remember to look at our lives through the eyes of God. I believe Colossians puts this beautifully because what does it look like when we look at our lives through his eyes? Reading, <coughs> excuse me, reading from Colossians chapter 1, verse 22 and 23 in the New Living Translation, it says this. Yet, now he has reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body. And as a result, he has brought you into his own presence. And you are holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. But you must continue to believe this truth and stand firm in it. Don't drift away from the assurance that you received when you heard the good news. So friends, today as we take communion, let us remember to look at our lives through God's eyes. Let's remember him. Let's remember to look at our past, our present, and our future through his promises, his love, and his hope for heaven. And let's pray together. Father God, thank you so much for this opportunity to come before you. An opportunity to be reminded of your love. To be reminded on how you view the world. In how you view us. In how you view our past. In how you view our sin, God. Remind our hearts, remind our minds, our thoughts, our emotions, God. Remind us of your love. Help us grow in our understanding on, on how deep your love actually is. Father God, we love you and we pray that this transforms our hearts, God. In your name, amen. For all the members of the church, if you'd like to contribute to our different operations, how we reach out to people, um, or even to the COVID fund where we have a food bank that meets the needs of those who have fallen in hard times during these tough situations, the details for our, our accounts will be on the screen. Please, let us give and share what we have for it goes a long way. Amen. Good morning, my brothers and my sisters. It is so great to come together once again this first day of the week so that we can worship together and we can learn from our Lord Jesus. Now, if you're joining us today for the very first time, we want to extend a very warm welcome to you. We are so glad that you could make it. Please feel at home and know that you're among us friends. We are the Zambia International Church of Christ and we are a family of ordinary men and women who believe that God has shown us so much grace, you know, by calling us into his family. And God has also called us so that we can know him and then we can be able to go spread his love to those around us. First and foremost, our newlyweds, Trombo and Eden, are back in town. And the sisters put such an awesome thing together, the kitchen party for them, uh, hosted on Zoom yesterday. And here are some images from the day. Thank you 
so much sisters for an awesome awesome job that you did and welcome Twambo and Eden. Now last week in our sermon um, Morris Katongo did a great job on Nehemiah chapter 3 encouraging you and I to play our role and how we all actually matter in the grand scheme of things and the work of God. Today we shall look at Nehemiah chapter 4. And you know, in this chapter, we shall see how Nehemiah as a leader and his people faced opposition as they were rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. You know, they had undertaken a great project. And you know, the evil one was not fired up. You know, as leaders in the kingdom of God, we are going to face opposition. You know, somebody will challenge your ideas. You know, we will get questioned about every single detail of the plan. You know, we will have uh, some people just standing back, maybe waiting for things to blow up or to go bad, and then to start ridiculing you. In the same way, as Christians, we shall face challenges and opposition from friends and family. You know, we will be discouraged, but we must strive to stay on course as disciples of Jesus. You know, as we return to our study of the book of Nehemiah today, you know, we are going to see him facing constant opposition. You know, he had a great plan, and he had the support of the king, but that did not mean that everything from that point on, you know, would be easy. In fact, we are going to see the very opposite. You know, as Christians, we shall face persecution and opposition even though God is on our side. Can you imagine that? You know, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, Paul tells uh, Timothy in verse 12 that in fact everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. And so today, the title of my message is Stay the Course of Rebuilding. Meaning, stay in the fight. Stay on course. So point number one, be prepared for setbacks. You know, when you resolve to do what's right in your daily lives, you can be certain that, you know, you will face challenges. Paul described it as the good fight, the good fight of the faith. You know, in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 12, he tells you, fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of eternal life that you were called to and have made a good confession about it in the presence of many witnesses. So, Paul made it clear. He made it clear to young Timothy that a life of faith would not be an easy choice. It would be tough. It would be a good fight. You and I are in the good fight, and therefore we must be ready for position and for persecution. And therefore, we must be ready to stay the course. So let's look at how Nehemiah is going to stand firm in the face of challenges. We're going to start by reading Nehemiah chapter 4 from verse 1 up to 6. This is what it says. When Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became furious. He mocked the Jews. He mocked the Jews before his colleagues and the powerful men of Samaria and said, what are these pathetic, feeble Jews doing? Can they restore it by themselves? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they, will they even finish the walls? Can they bring these burnt stones back to life from the, molds, the mounds and rubble? Then Tobiah the Ammonite, who was beside him, said, Indeed, even if a fox climbed up what they were building, he would break down the stone wall. Listen, our God, for we are despised. Make their insults return on their own heads and let them be taken as plunder to a land of captivity. Do not cover their guilt or let their sin be erased from your sight because they have provoked the builders. So we rebuilt the wall until the entire wall was joined together up to half its height for the people had the will to keep working. Amen. This is such an awesome passage, brothers and sisters. You know, when Sanballat heard what was going on, he was not fired up. You know, Sanballat, according to sources outside of the Bible, who, I mean, says that he was the governor of Samaria in the latter half of the 5th century. 
you know, and one of the, he was one of the chief opponents of Nehemiah's plan to rebuild Jerusalem. Because if Jerusalem was to be rebuilt, it would mean that Jerusalem would begin thriving again. And with that renewed life, it would mean that Sanballat's re region would diminish in its importance. And so he was just not happy. So really the key thing here, you know, at the heart of San Sanballat's issue is basically jealousy. You know, he feared that Nehemiah would succeed and it would mean the spotlight will, re will turn off from Sanballat. You know, isn't that how Satan operates? He's always jealous. He's al he always wants, you know, to measure up to God. That's why he was hurled down from heaven because he had started a rebellion. He wanted to be, uh, to be at par with God. Let's look at a few of the attacks that Sanballat actually uh, uh, directed to Nehemiah and the Jews who were rebuilding the walls. The first thing he says, this feeble Jews. He called them feeble. You know, the truth is that they were just returning from captivity. You know, have you ever been on a football team coming off a terrible uh, stretch, maybe a terrible loss, like maybe 7-0? See, that, that's how the Jews were. They did not have an air of confidence about them. They were still in the reality of that shameful defeat. So Sanballat began by saying, look at these feeble Jews. You know, we don't know exactly what the world looked like at this point, but there is no doubt that this was an enormous task without benefit of uh, modern day tools like bulldozers that would have helped to maybe clear up the rubble and things like that. So it was an impossible task, you know, to anybody. And so uh, Sanballat was definitely just giving them the picture, the reality of things to try and stop them or discourage them. He even says, will they even offer sacrifices? He basically wanted, started attacking their spirituality. You know, Satan tries to remind us of our, of, our, of our failures, our past failures. He makes us feel like, you know, our past failures are too great that we can't actually get, get up from, from the rubble of our spiritual failures. Here are the Israelites attempting to rebuild. They were rebuilding due to the disobedience of their own families earlier on. God's judgment on Israel is what actually had brought them into this situation. And so we must say that, you know, basically their past failures were just too great. They didn't qualify for this rebuilding job that they were doing. And that's what Sanbarat was trying to help him you know, to, to paint, the picture he was trying to paint. He's mocking their dependence on God. You know, this would have been an easy task, sorry, an easy attack because it is what got them in that, in that situation anyway. Their disobedience had led to the walls being destroyed by their own enemies, allowed by God, basically. So it is as if Sanballat was saying, you know, oh, now you're going to worship the Lord again? You think that is going to happen? You know, he's mocking them. You know, he's telling them, you think you're going to bring these stones back to life? That last attack basically relates to stones. He's trying to convince them that the materials that they, they're trying to use to, to rebuild will not help them. But you and I, we know that... Uh, you know, these are the very, very stones that eventually they used to rebuild the walls, and the walls were great, and it was awesome. Are we together here? Look, I want to ask you, brothers and sisters, how are you doing spiritually? How is the rebuilding going on in your life right now? You know, we, we started the year by talking about rebuilding and renewing and restoration. We embarked on rebuilding our own spiritual lives. We embarked on rebuilding our families our personal lives and our characters. You know, you may have fallen low in your Christianity. And as you're trying to rebuild, Satan is reminding you of all your failures and he's discouraging you. I want to encourage you, brothers and sisters, don't stop. Stay the course. Keep working at it. Like Nehemiah and the Jews, you will succeed. Look at verse 3. You know, verse 3 of Nehemiah chapter 4. You know, the Bible says, you know, then Tobiah the Ammonite, who was beside him, said, indeed, even if a fox climbed up that wall that they are building, he would break down the stone wall. You know, what an accusation here. They're saying that the wall was so, would be so weak that a fox walking on it would actually cause it to fall over. How does that accusation compare with reality? The answer is that it is completely, completely ridiculous. 
it is not true that a fox walking over that wall would actually make it fall. Eventually, when they rebuilt the wall, actually it was nine feet thick when they finished the, uh, rebuilding the wall. You know, Satan basically was wanting to discourage these men who are rebuilding. Satan always wants to discourage us so that we do not continue to rebuild. You know, Satan is going to come to you. He's going to tell you that, you know what, your faith is so weak that you, you won't last a month in the kingdom of God. So he tells you, you know what, just give up. Throw in the towel. Stop. Please don't. Keep fighting. He will tell you that your marriage is over. That child of yours is gone. You know, you're already so deep in sin that you can't come out. So just give up. I want to tell you, brothers and sisters, don't give up. Keep up the fight. Stay in the ring. Stay in the fight. Respond like Nehemiah. Look at what Nehemiah says in, in, in verse 4. In Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 4. He, he tells God, listen our God, for we are despised. Make the insults return on their own heads. And let them be taken as plunder to a land of captivity. Do not cover up their guilt or let their sin be erased from your sight because they have provoked the builders. And so we rebuilt the wall until the entire wall was joined together up to half its height. For the people had the will to keep working. You know, let's be honest. This is not the kind of prayer that you'd expect from a man of God, so to say. It, it, it kind of sounds a little harsh. But you know what? Let's look at what this prayer really meant. First and foremost, Nehemiah asked for God's judgment. He didn't ask God for permission to judge the accusers. You know, he asked for God's judgment upon them. Nehemiah prayed this because he truly believed that rebuilding the wall was God's work. It wasn't Nehemiah's work. So Sanballat and Tobiah, who were the enemies, were rejecting God. They were not rejecting Nehemiah. So he's not arrogantly thinking that God will act just because he likes Nehemiah that much. But the point is that Nehemiah knew that he was carrying out the work of God. And so as he faced opposition, he boldly prayed that God would take care of the situation. That God would take care of the setbacks. That God would take care of the roadblocks. That God would deal with his enemies as he saw fit. Amen. And so in verse 6, it goes on to say that, so we rebuilt the wall until the entire wall was joined together up to half its height. For the people had the will to keep working. You know, brothers and sisters, I love this statement. That the people had the will to keep working. And so I ask you this morning, do you have the will to keep rebuilding God's church? How much are you contributing to the rebuilding of God's church? How about your ministry? How much are you helping your family group leader? Are you reaching out to the weak disciple in your ministry to help them get back on their feet, calling them up and praying with them? Are you willing to stay in the fight until there is victory? You know, how about giving in terms of your contributions towards the work of God's church? How is that going? You know, the truth is that God does not look at how much you contribute, but he is looking at your willing heart. So whatever little you give, as long as it is with a willing heart, with a good heart, God accepts it. And so I ask you, my brothers and my sisters, are you a sun ballot? Are you discouraging the work of the Lord? Or are you part of the solution? I will be honest with you. Some of you who are older Christians, it's very easy to discourage the younger Christians. When you see a young Christian fired up and very excited to serve God, you go, ah, this one. This one will run out of gas very soon. <laughs> you know, we were just like that and see where we are. Well, if that's your attitude, you need to repent big time and get back on course. Build them up. Build those young Christians up. Help them serve God. And if you are a young Christian, and uh, uh, sorry, if you are a young Christian and you're zealous for God, don't let any older Christian with a sunburned spirit discourage you. Nehemiah refused to be discouraged, and he helped the Jews rebuild the walls and their relationship with God. He kept the focus, and it was rewarded. So we need to stay 
the course. Keep the focus. So now, let's look at Nehemiah chapter 4 from verse 7 up to 9. And let's see how Sanballat and his enemies actually reacted to what uh, Nehemiah was doing and what he said. In verse 7, the Bible says, But when Sanballat, Tobiah, and the Arabs, and the Ammonites, and the people of Ashdod heard that the repairs to Jerusalem's walls had gone ahead, and that the gaps were being closed, they were very angry. They all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. But we prayed to our God and posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. This is awesome. You know, when you resist the devil, he will flee. He will get angry, and that's all he can do. <laughs> he can only get angry, but he won't do anything. You know, the devil is like a dog that just barks to scare us, but he won't bite. Look at Nehemiah's response in verse 9. But we prayed. Prayer is so key, my brothers and my sisters. I am so excited about the 40 days of prayer program that we are on right now for midweeks. How are you doing in that area? Have you put down your list of impossible things that you want God to do for you? Are you praying and looking for miracles that God is doing in your life? Is one of your prayer items, is one of them about your own spiritual revival and renewal? Brothers and sisters, don't let Satan beat you down. Pray and pray and pray. And I'm telling you, the evil one will flee away. Prayer will keep you in the fight. Prayer will keep you on course. And Satan will not do anything. Point number two, and basically lastly, refine and refocus. And this time we're going to read Nehemiah chapter 4 from verse 10. And we're going to read all the way to verse 23 because there's some great points in there. Meanwhile, the people in Judah said, the strength of the laborers is giving out. And there's so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. Also, our enemies said, before they know it or see us, we will be right there among them and we will kill them and put an end to their work. Then the Jews who lived near them came and told us ten times over, wherever you turn, they will attack us. Therefore, I stationed some of the people behind the lowest points of the wall at the exposed places, posting them by families with their swords, spears, and bows. After I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord, who is great and awesome, and fight for your families, for your sons and for your daughters, your wives and your homes. When our enemies heard that we were aware of their plot and that God had frustrated it, we all returned to the wall, each to our own work. From that day on, half of my men did the work, while the other half were equipped with spears and shields and bows and armor. The officers posted themselves behind all the people of Judah who were rebuilding the wall. Those who carried materials did their work with one hand and held a weapon in the other hand. And each of the builders wore his sword at his side as he walked. But the man who sounded the trumpet stayed with me. Then I said to the nobles, and the officials and the rest of the people. The work is extensive and spread out, and we are widely separated from each other along the wall. Wherever you hear the sound of the trumpet, join us there. Our God will fight for us. So we continued the work with half the men holding spears from the first light of dawn till the stars came out. At that time, I also said to the people, have every man and his helper stay inside Jerusalem at night so they can serve us as guards by night and as workers by day. Neither I, I nor my brothers, nor my men, nor the guards with me took off their clothes. Each had his weapon even when he went, sorry, even when he went for water. Look at this awesome organization that Nehemiah put together. You know, the situation was, the people were getting discouraged. In verse 10, it says that, you know, they, they were wearing down. Their strength was actually sapping out or giving out. The materials that, were, uh, the, 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 that they were using to rebuild were not adequate to rebuild the wall. 
There was so much rubble. You know, there was so much heap of, uh, you know, the ruins. But you know what? Nehemiah had to respond to the people. The focus was eternal. Nehemiah called the people together and spoke to them. He mobilized them together. You know, sometimes that is the first and most important thing for us to do, brothers and sisters. For us to remember that we are facing a challenging time. But you know what? We are not alone. We are not in it alone. The people were discouraged, yes, and they were convinced that the task was too big. But Nehemiah called them together and he united them, united them together. He helped them to realize that they are not alone. You know, he helped them to think, you know what? We are not alone. In this battle, we are together. You know, look at the kind of, uh, uh, you know, leadership that, uh, that, that came about. When, 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 when they joined forces together, then they were united and they were working together. The Bible says in verse 15, when our enemies heard that we knew their scheme and that God had frustrated it, every one of us returned to his own work on the wall. You know, the work continued. Those who were discouraged came back. Those who were feeling, can we finish this? They came back together. Our battle and our journey, brothers and sisters, is eternal. We are not about to finish. You and I, we must refine ourselves and refocus so that whenever we face challenges, we must keep together. We must keep fighting for each other, for our families, and for the church. And then you know what? God will help us to rebuild. You know, we need to be together in all these things, brothers and sisters. You know, we cannot work alone. Like, like Nehemiah said, you know, we are in this thing together. You know, let me finish uh, with an encouragement from Paul uh, to the Philippians also to, and also to the Colossians. In Philippi Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8, it says, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any moral excellence and if there is any praise, dwell on these things. Isn't that awesome? Let our mind dwell on things that are noble, that are excellent, that are building, that are, you know, trustworthy. Look at what he also tells the Colossians in chapter 3, verse 2. Set your minds on what is above, not on what is on earth. Meaning, let us have a heavenly and eternal perspective, brothers and sisters. So whatever challenges we are facing today, you know what? They are temporal, but what we are looking forward to is eternal. The idea is for you and I to focus, to stay focused on the Lord, to fix our eyes on him. That's what Nehemiah did. He kept his eyes on God. He refused to be de deterred by the distractions and discouragement that was all around him. We all need that word this morning, brothers and sisters. When we get so discouraged by all that is happening around us, we need to fix our eyes on the Lord and call him to direct our steps. I love this song called We Shall Overcome. And these are some of the lyrics in that song. You know, it says, we shall overcome. We shall overcome. We shall overcome someday. Or deep in my heart, I do believe we shall overcome someday. We are not afraid. We are not afraid. We are not afraid today. Oh, deep in my heart, I do believe we shall overcome someday. We are not alone. We are not alone. We are not alone today. Oh, deep in my heart, I do believe we are not alone today. We'll walk hand in hand. We'll walk hand in hand. We will walk hand in hand someday. Oh, deep in my heart, I do believe we shall overcome someday. The Lord will see us through. The Lord will see us through. The Lord will see us through someday. Oh, deep in my heart, I do believe we shall overcome someday. He says, we shall overcome someday, brothers and sisters. So let us stay the course. Let us expect setbacks, but let us not let them destroy or discourage us. Let us refine and refocus when things are not going on so well. You know, when we are facing those hardships and those challenges, 
Brothers and sisters, refine and refocus. Let us look into each other and draw from each other's strength and let us stay focused. Let us know that God is on our side because we shall overcome. Amen, brothers and sisters. God bless.
brothers and sisters, uh, just like I said in the message, uh, you know, we are here and we have to stay the course, you know, so that we make it one day to the very end. And I love the song that, uh, of course, the words that I shared, that we shall overcome. So we are all overcomers, brothers and sisters. Do not be a victim. Let us be overcomers. In this coming week, uh, we will continue with the, our 40 days of prayer. You know, I hope it's going on well with you. You know, today was uh, uh, the, the fifth day. I hope you've already done your fifth day and that you are on course. You are looking out for those miracles and you are just uh, having an incredible walk with God that you can fail. And so please tune in on Tuesday. Please do not miss out. Tune in on Tuesday for, our, uh, for the 40 days uh, of prayer by, with Kit Cummings. And it promises to be a great and wonderful time. It's on Tuesday at 6.30 or at 18.30 hours. Uh, please be reminded, we are not doing the Wednesday service, we're doing on Tuesday so that we can be able to have a great time together. And then, of course, next Sunday, we're going to come together again and worship together, and it promises to be a fantastic time as well. Let's go to God in prayer in closure of all these things that we've been doing today. Father in heaven, we are so very grateful and thankful once again. Just thank you, Father, for reminding us that, Lord, you are on our side, for reminding us through Nehemiah and the people of Jerusalem that, God Almighty, it is doable. Even when things look so impossible, even when we are facing all kinds of challenges, uh, even when we are facing opposition, God, from the evil one or from our enemies, that we should not stop the work. We should stay the course and continue to work until the end, O oh Master in heaven, God. And I want to pray, God, that you help every single brother or sister or even visitor or every, any friend who is joining us today, God. You know their lives. You know what's going on in their, in their lives, O oh Master in heaven. I pray that you'll give them the strength, that you help them to keep uh, the, in the fight, Almighty God, and not to give up, O oh Master in heaven. Help us to, to draw from each other's strength, O oh God. Help us to be refined, Father God, Lord. Help us to be restored and renewed, uh, you know, spiritually speaking, O oh Master in Heaven, we want to help your church to move forward to the glory of your great and wonderful name, O oh Master in Heaven. We look forward to a great week ahead of us, O oh Master in Heaven. We pray that, Father God, Lord, on, on Tuesday as we gather together, Lord Almighty, for just uh, the, the 40 days of prayer, uh, as we do day seven on that day, Lord God, I just want to beg you that it will be wonderful, it will be awesome, and that your name will be exalted. We will draw closer to you like never before, O oh King of all kings, Father. Thank you so much, Lord. Thank you once again for the awesome communion by Jonathan, Lord Almighty. Thank you so much for using him greatly and just reminding us of Father God, Lord, of the cross of Christ. We love you. We praise you. We exalt you. We look forward to a great week. In Jesus' name we pray all these things. Amen. And God bless you all. Thank you for joining our service this morning. If you'd like to get in touch with us, feel free to use any of the numbers displayed on the screen. 